introduce. Hi, I'm Eric. I work at Bol.com currently as the head of data science, where I'm tasked to make sure that as uh, the company, we make the best use of data science in general. Um, before, uh, I was acting as a, um, there we go, as a product manager, so the, the uh, bottom left bubble we saw in the previous talk, um, and I have a formal background in applied physics. So always trying to understand how does the world work, and I think that's in essence also what data science uh, is trying to do, trying to understand the process that you're working with and how that translates into what we do. And one of the reasons why I love doing this at um, Bol.com, as a quick introduction of uh, what we're doing, is um, we're trying to realize our mission to together change retail and make everyday life easier. And the reasons how we do that basically is to look at what people need and how can we better accommodate for that. And to make it more tangible, if you look at what we've done over the last uh, 21 years, you see that we've typically added more and more to our offering. And I'll not go too much into the top part of adding what we are selling, but I'll go more into the actual uh, bottom part, where you see where we have added ways how we bring things to you. So we're not only selling products, but we're also bringing you digital products. We're no longer uh, shipping things through a single warehouse. We have three, four, five warehouses to bring stuff to you. And we no longer have a, a single language application, but we're now also moving into the French speaking part uh, of Belgium. And the reason why that's interesting in our context is because every step that we add adds complexity. So for instance, imagine the warehouse. If you just have one warehouse where you can stock your goods, it's easy to tell to a supplier, bring it here. If you have two of them, it's a choice. If you add one more warehouse, that's not a simple choice anymore of one, two, three, but your complexity actually scales uh, exponentially. And that's the point where a technology like data science can actually make a profound difference because you can scale with that complexity um, as it comes to you and it, you can continue to offer a differentiated retail offering to your customer and as such change retail. And we've been doing that on a wide range of applications um, or a throughout the store. Uh, so think about uh, product recommendations, product search. I think classical fields where uh, we help you to find the goods that you're looking for. Think about fraud and risk management where we try to, feel, uh, try to find people that are doing malpractice at scale and always beating them in the cat and mouse game. Um, we're doing that within logistics to make sure that we can keep pushing the boundaries on not only getting the goods to you in time, but also getting goods to you efficiently. So not a single item in a box like that, but making sure that they are packaged in a way that we don't ship too much air and produce too much CO2. And the reason why I'm giving you all of this background of how Bol.com works is because basically this was the, uh, the origin of why the list came to be. And the list I'll be talking to you about is what we have learned to make data science come alive in practice effectively because we found that to do this at scale, to have this application you just saw uh, run across 20 teams, we need to decentralize the discipline. We need to make sure that uh, not a single centralized team did data science for everyone because that doesn't scale. We need to make sure that everyone could do this at their own pace. So we saw that scale means decentralization, but it also comes with a challenge that if you have indeed data science everywhere, if you have many teams doing this, it's hard to keep them aligned. It's hard for them to, um, to learn what one team learns across teams. It's hard to make sure that if you ever want to switch teams, you come into a place where you have a common way of working, common tool set, a common way of um, how indeed you do, for instance, your ML ops sequence we just saw. And to make sure that uh, we're not only aligned, but together are raising the bar, we set out to um, describe a set of um, learnings we had across these teams. Because if you think about how does learning work, it's very simple. Um, basically, you make a mistake. You think, hey, wait, this is not the intent that I had. You think about how can I change the way how I got here. And you look at did it change the outcome. 
And of course, in this example, it's a very simple one. Um, here, you would, for instance, change how you put on your sweater and then check again uh, your label. If you were to find, again, a label on the front end, you would think, hey, maybe I go shopping for sweaters at the wrong store. But that's the thing. The moment you have insight, the moment you figure out why something went wrong, you can change your behavior, but that's something you can share. That's something that you can share with different teams. And once you share that, basically they can make the change before actually they are making the mistake, and as such, indeed, learn together. So this is the whole reason why we set out to the end. This is, of course, still dry matter, and I'll try and make it more come alive with the actual list itself. And do note that when we're setting out to create this one, we ask a lot of people, okay, how should this look like? What should be part of that? And of course, then you get a lot of people and a lot of opinions with um, not always the most condensed way of telling it. It needs something data. Yeah, but what then? Yeah, but, yeah, but data is important. Yeah, that's kind of in the name of data science. So we got that. So what does it mean? And after um, a few rounds of iterations, we actually got to this first implementation of the list, which I think as the title tells you, tells you it's, it's not complete. It's something that will be changing um, daily, weekly. And for the, um, the careful reader, you'll find that compared to the outline that you had before PyData, um, what you'll see today is actually, again, an iteration on top of that. Because everyone that reads the list adds something to it, removes something through it to improve on it. And that would be my question also to all of you today is, please share what your thoughts are Please share what appeals to you. Please share what you recognize from your company in the intent to make this better. And um, two footnotes for that one um, is that do know this, we have written this within the context of Bol.com, um, which is an online retailer which allows you to do certain things that you, for instance, you couldn't do, could not do in, for instance, healthcare, we saw earlier this morning. Um, and it also indeed allows to work within the structure that we have with teams. Um, as such, for instance, this would not translate that well into academia or for people doing their PhD, for instance. Different contexts, different settings. Um, and the final thing we said is we're going to constrain this to six. We're going to have six items. Um, if you ever want to add a seventh, we're going to say, okay, it, this is going at the expense of something else or we'll merge it just to make sure that the list that we have in the end is not just a huge CSV you could actually do data science on, but a list of six items. Um, so what I'll be doing for the rest of the talk is a condensed version of the actual list itself. And then for two of them, go more in depth and tell war stories of um, either how we've learned it the hard way or how we've applied it in practice to make sure that uh, we actually got the benefit from it. And this is the one that we ended up with. Um, a list of six, phrased, sort of catchy, uh, but below it, a lot of things that actually should be able to help you in your daily practice when putting data science, in, um, uh, when trying to create value out of data science. And um, first one often I think we've seen that, seen that a few times already today is make sure that you understand your problem. Um, because, oh, there we go. Um, because it allows you to do two things. One, it allows you to solve the actual problem at hand. And I think uh, Vladimir just now already mentioned it well, is the best way to solve the problem is not by a model, but actually removing something that's, that's creating that. Uh, be sure to do that. But also you need, if you understand your problem you're trying to solve for your customer, then you within your team can decide autonomously what the best way to solve that is. And that's, I think, what you immediately reflected in uh, the bottom part, is if you, want, uh, if you want to understand your problem, you actually need to understand context. You need to understand your user. You need to understand why they use Excel that many of us hate. Um, but there's a reason for that. So that means sitting next to them whilst they are doing their daily job. That means it's asking questions. That means putting yourself in their perspective which choices they make, how, why are they hard, what are uh, the upsides or downsides of getting it wrong. And it also means that if you understand the problem and you see a different way to solve it, 
you need to challenge your users on how to do it differently. That's when indeed you become most effective. Not saying, oh, is this what you need? Oh, I'll make that for you. No, challenge them. Think along with and to refine what you're actually trying to solve. I'll get to this one more in a deep dive later. The second one is um, fail fast to learn fast. This is something that uh, we've learned time and time again. Basically, this means that um, if you put something out there in a very rough form, it allows you to correct direction fast. Hey, I thought you meant this, right? No, I meant something else. Ah, okay, that's cool, because I haven't invested a lot of time yet. I can easily course correct. Um, and the second thing it does, it allows you to validate uh, assumptions. We think this helps, doesn't it? If it turns out it doesn't, then you can course correct fast without indeed having constructed a full pipeline or invest a lot of time in um, exploring data. If one of your key assumptions doesn't work, it doesn't work. What does this mean? This means that you need to show stuff to your team, to your product owner, to your product manager, to your users, which isn't done yet, which isn't refined, which isn't polished, which can go wrong, which might be scary, which might reflect poorly back on you, but that's worth it at the expense of the feedback that you will get and not wasting time in a, in a direction that is not the intent of your user's problem. And the second thing that you need to do is you need to think out loud. You need to uh, allow people to look in your brain, which they typically can't. Uh, after all, data science is not brain surgery, so you need to help them there. You need to think out loud of, on where is your mind? What, what's the direction that you have? Where do you think is the right solution? Um, and by doing so, you allow others to give you feedback on your direction. And again, that's something that takes effort, that takes time, but it always pays off. And as an example, um, this is one actually the first, one of the very first versions that um, I showed to people when whilst creating this list. Just a few stickies, just a few scratches, just a few, and already get tons of feedback. And only after that, you go into the fancy fancy uh, PowerPoint animations, uh, which in the end don't work. Next one up, pick the right tool. Um, we've heard this, I think, a, a few times over. Um, and it won't be the first time that someone tries to solve a problem with a neural net, which they could have done with three lines of SQL. And the reason why this is indeed so much important to, to pick the right tool, because quite often you can already solve a problem a lot faster than you would have done otherwise. And that's time gained. And secondly, by picking the right tool, you get to balance a lot better about uh, complexity of your tools versus the features that you have. And it won't be the first time that I saw people um, you need to start to uh, build an entire Airflow instance where in the end they had one job run daily. I mean, that's what a cron job does really well. Stick with that because everyone understands that. The thing, however, if you want to do this, you need to be up to date on what's there. You need to be available. You need to know what all the tools that are out there are actually doing. That takes time. But that's time you always get back either in new projects or get back in just days of fun while attending conferences like these where you can do this. And second, you need to make deliberate choices. And that's the thing typically what, I, what you also see is that you, every now and then you need to pick the simple tool to get started, to get your assumptions corrected, to get insights in, knowing that down the road you need to correct for that, but that's fine. And that choice is typically also skipped. The fourth one, um, leveraging craftsmanship. Um, it's I think also we just saw with, with Vladimir right now um, already. It's uh, I think maybe the one from this that I personally love the most. It's, uh, there we go, sorry. Um, in the teams that we have, if you, need, you were to put people together with different skill sets, you get to benefit from each other. Uh, you don't have to go for the uh, X ops uh, unicorn we just saw, but you get to hire a software engineer that understands the basics of data science, but get to bring the expertise on, uh, on versioning, on how to build an API, on how to build a Kubernetes cluster. So you can work together. You can have, have a data scientist that indeed does the basics of version control, asks if he have, has a, a tough uh, merge conflict, and then puts his most time in developing models. And if you work like that, 
if you rely on each other to be effective, you create shared ownership. So indeed, it's no longer uh, one person builds something, chucks it over the fence, and someone else then puts it in production. And if it breaks, you know, they'll be pointing towards each other who's full of this. By working together like this, you build ownership. And especially in our case, you can open up the app and you can show that to your mother and say, we built this. How cool is that? The downside of that is you need to trust your team. You need to be okay with the fact that there are some parts of your product that you build that you don't fully understand. Someone else does, but you don't, and that's okay. It also requires you to push back when someone tells you how to do it. Because as a craftsman, typically you've learned your job in five years, 10 years, 20 years of academic training or in the field practice, you know how to do things. So push back for people that say, what do you need? What are your requirements? And then let me do my job. And this is indeed where you get to leverage craftsmanship and make sure that everyone indeed does the thing they do best and love most. Fifth out of sixth, and then I'll get to the war stories and where it becomes messy. Um, something you see go wrong quite often is you take small directed steps. And uh, why is this one so important? Because by taking small steps, I think by iterating quite often, um, you get to reap incremental benefits. And especially in a, in a organization like Bull.com where we have transactions daily, if you get to improve 1% today, we can already gain from that. We can already enthuse our users by having something that works. And having a model on the shelf indeed that, that could have that benefit doesn't do anything. So small steps. And indeed, iterate often. Not with the fact um, that indeed, all of them are beneficial, but with the fact that you get to learn a lot faster. If you just take small steps, does this work? Does this work? Does this work? And indeed, it gets you the course correct. If you want to do this though, you need to know where you stand, and I'll get back to that one, because this one is deep dive as well, and break down the work. Um, more detail in the deep dive. And uh, finally, what we've seen that a lot of effective teams do is they excite, your use, they excite their users. They don't say, hey, what do you want? Okay, here's your table of numbers, good luck with that. But they make sure they go the extra mile in uh, making people happy about what they get. So um, the point of this, why would you do that? is this ensures that all the hard work that you put in actually gets adopted. It means that um, if you have worked really hard to build a forecast, people actually start to do planning based on that because they like what they see. It's not just a table of numbers for them anymore. They know what has gone in, they know what enables them to do, and they like it. And if you like the first thing that you got, you're going to be curious about what's more. What's next? What else can you do for me to make my job even better? And that's, I think, typically the dynamic that you would always uh, like to create. It's create pool from your users to um, get even more cool products out there, which you typically get when you excite your users. What does it require you to do? Um, do demos. Show your work. Give people uh, little widgets that they can interact with and play around with for them to understand and to see what happens. Hey, what happens if I put in this funny word? Hey, what happens if, if we have this weird number come in? And that's where people start to understand the model and start to have fun together. And what this also means is that you need to manage expectations. Data science is not magic that can make every problem go away. It's not that, oh, we can forecast everything with within 1% accuracy. You can't. But you can manage expectations in such a way that you deliver on what you know, people are looking for and then go the mile beyond. It takes work, but it can be done. Then going for the second test, and this is, I think, Frans, if you could help me flip back to the other one. Really curious is, uh, whoop, and I think this one is the point where indeed it gets broken. We have a missing in the lines. That's okay. Um, I was going to do a first quick round of interactions. I think it will not link because I have a different code here than you have there. If you were to test it, you can give an answer, but most likely it will not show up on the screen. Can we try that real quick?
Yes, it is 7.59. Oh, actually it works. Oh, cool. Well, this one is the first question that we need getting feedback from, say, the first outset that you've heard. Which one appeals to you most and which one do you think makes perfect sense? Or which one do you think, I don't think this is the most important thing? And here we see already a need uh, on a scale from uh, zero to seven, a few of them scoring quite well. I think there's already a clear winner I need on understanding what you're actually trying to solve. And below that, there's a struggle. Be sure to fill this one out. And I think then, um, do you already have the second one there as well? which I think would typically also be, which is the one that you're missing? Uh, it's fine to leave that one open, just for the next 10 minutes, think about that. Hey, if I look at my context, what have I learned? Um, it's typically helping us the, the most. Um, and add it to the list. It allows me to incorporate feedback and to make it even better. But with that, let's switch back to the, um, uh, to the slides there. Um, and take two examples to make these come alive. I know it's been already a long day with lots of talks. Um, and let's see, you need a few of the use cases where we've actually tried to apply this. And the first one um, is a case we did earlier this year uh, when we were uh, asked by actually the government to help them manage the whole COVID pandemic. Uh, they reached out to us, a, a conglomerate or a collaboration program um, all five big multinationals, so KLM, NS, ING, Philips, and Aldo Hase, together under the Kickstart AI pro uh, program, to help them look to incorporate all of our knowledge and expertise about AI and ML, to help them predict what will COVID do in the Netherlands. Um, and as such, help them manage the scarce resources in healthcare to make sure that uh, we make the most out of that. And um, by the way, combine those five corporates, uh, three governmental agencies, and you have 13 days to build something that runs in production. Best of luck with that. So here what we did is, first things first, we wanted to understand our problem. What are we trying to solve? How does it work? And the first one for us was clear. We needed to solve uh, or release uh, the pressure that was on our ICs where people with COVID would be um, uh, assigned to beds, stay there for a while, and if indeed they were ever to exceed capacity, especially locally, we could relocate patients. And the better we know how to relocate them, the better it was. So that's the first bit. This is what we knew. This we're helping decision makers manage COVID in the hospital. Cool. The assumption there was is we might have a signal that can help us do that because we measure the, um, the presence of COVID particles in our sewage water across the country. That's something we, we measure. We have that data somewhere and that might help us. Okay, so we asked some questions about how does that process work then and how is that uh, being done? But how does COVID work? Okay, let's dive into that then. And then we learned, this is what they call a infection pyramid, where the basic understanding is that um, people get sick, but without symptoms. But from that point onwards, uh, you already have virus particles um, basically in your stool, already there. But you might not even be uh, symptomatic. Once you get symptomatic, some people get tested. Some people that get tested actually are infected. Some people that are infected might actually end up in the hospital. And some people that end up in the hospital might actually also die from the COVID. But that's basically a, a funnel where uh, the number of people diminishes over time. And there's a sequence to that. Okay, we have a rough understanding of why a sewage water measurement could help predict this because there's a time difference between those. Okay, Let, let's see how we can use that. Um, so we sat down with a team, and we asked everyone, okay, make us, just draw a draft based on your current understanding of what type of information and data would you like to present to decision makers to help them make that call. And 
What we did here, and it's not important to see actual details, but we asked everyone just to, to draw their understanding. And this allowed us to ask questions. Why do you have disks? Why do you have um, it for each bit of the country? Why do you have um, a top line? Well, this is because I understand it like this. Ah, you get to ask a details question, okay, what metric am I seeing there? And this is the point where as a team, we found out that we're not going to predict the number of people that get infected. We're going to predict the number of people that actually end up in the hospital for two reasons. One, we understood that that was the scarce resources that actually people were managing. And two, we, understand, we understood from um, how COVID works that that introduces the biggest time lag between when the particles are, available, are already present in your stool towards when actually things happen in the hospital. So you get more time that to act. That's what we were looking for. And all of that came from, um, from building understanding, from having that conversation, and for just you know, having, that having those talks. And um, in the end, we ended up with basically an action list just like this. So no Kanban boards, no sprint things. Just this, this was our action list with just one line of text assigned to people because people knew what they had to do. They knew the context, they knew the problem, they knew how it was going to work and how they were actually going to implement that. So that was up to them. In the end, this worked out quite well uh, because currently, indeed within 13 days, we offered a solution to the government, which is a fully um, GitHub managed, Dockerized application that does PyTorch for training and a fast API for the dashboards that they have. And we did away with all of the pipelines, we just collected all of the data every single time you spin up a container for simplicity, there was not that much data. Um, and this is currently live for decision makers in terms of A-B testing, whether it actually helps them. And we managed that in 13 days, despite spending the first five of those solely building our understanding. And that's I think where you can see this um, already come alive. Two and a half. Going to scatter them. Quickly fast. Huh? Including questions. All righty. Then the one minute version of <laughs> take small direct, directed steps. Um, in terms of context, uh, we started off with a forecasting team that would do ML forecasting, given that the entire organization was doing forecasting in Excel. And they would send their Excel results back and forth by email create scenario, version control, nah. uh, consistency, nah. uh, error prone Excel sheets. Nah. So we set out to help them. And the thing we learned here, and then I think this chart actually summarizes most, is if you were to ever change people or want to help people with an ML um, problem, be sure to always act in one direction, either in the direction of performance or in the direction of process. And do that many times over, so iterate over those uh, time and time again in order to come to a solution. And every single step should be in one direction. Um, and as an example, uh, if you were to change a forecast from a weekly to a daily level, make sure the numbers add up to your old forecast. So if people compare them, they're the same. It's just going from weekly to daily. If you move from Excel to uh, something that's being computed on the cloud, make sure the numbers are the same. So you just change the process. If you were to ever change an old profit model to a, um, a RIMA-based model or a deep AR, make sure that you keep everything the same but the numbers so people can compare them. That helps you in adoption um, and make sure things go fast. And the final one um, to keep in mind here, know what your target and your benchmark is. In these steps, make sure that performance-wise, you go to the point that you're actually at the same performance at the current state or slightly below. And if you're there, only invest in, in process because that's where you need to invest to get people um, on board to adopt your process. We did this time and time and again, and our current situation, what we've managed to do is not only have a centralized forecasting team that supports, I think over 80% of our operational teams, but also allow them to be interconnected. 
So if we change a feature in our central forecast, we know that every downstream forecast uh, is also affected and improved. And we would not have gotten to this major step from local desktop driven Excel to a centrally managed forecasting team if we would not have taken small directed steps. With that, um, my final question would be, if you still have the app, if it runs, please drop in all the feedback that you have because that's the only way I can make this list even better. Thanks. <laughs>